It was a movie like no other movie, and it had a profound impact on New York. That story next. We'll hear from people who, like you, watch the ultimate disaster movie tonight on television. This is Eyewitness News with Mark Haynes, Ann Butler, Bill Gutsch, Jerry Azar, and the Eyewitness News team. Good evening. Here's what's happening. Most of you who watched the ABC movie the day after are probably still feeling just a little numb right now. Maybe you discussed what you saw with your family and friends. It still leaves you, though, wondering about life, about the world, and about what you'd do if you knew the nuclear missiles were, in fact, on the way here. Well, our reporter, McGee Hickey, has been out all night gauging New York's reaction to the day after. More than 700 people packed Riverside Church tonight to watch the day after. Many said they came here because they were afraid to watch it alone. While the TV movie was being shown, the streets of New York were a lot less crowded than usual for a Sunday night. Even in the Times Square area, which is usually so crowded, these streets are relatively empty. And ticket sales at some movie theaters were off by as much as 50 percent. Why aren't you at home watching the day after? Well, I, I had commitments and I had to go out, that's why. But I really would like to see it. I'm at work and I'm on my lunch break right now, but my mother's home watching the movie right now. Most bars in the city showed the day after on their screens. Business at this bar dropped off by half. This has been so hyped in the uh, other areas of the media that people are just sticking home to watch it, and it's affecting us dramatically here. I teach fourth grade at St. Anthony's in the Bronx, and I think that my children will want to discuss this tomorrow, and I want to make sure that I caught it. You could have stayed home. Well, I was out this evening, and I needed to find a place with a television, and this seemed the most appropriate. Once the TV movie was over here at Riverside Church, volunteers passed out pieces of stationery and asked everyone to write a letter to a loved one detailing their reaction to the TV movie. This woman wrote a letter to her two-year-old daughter. Under the letter, a carbon to be sent to the White House. My letter says that um, I witnessed an illustration of the horrors of nuclear destruction and what it can do. And I promise her that in some way I will try to make sure that we never have to uh, experience that. Volunteers then linked the White House letters into a chain to be sent to the president. Riverside Church leader Dr. William Sloan Coffin, a leader in the nuclear freeze movement, then led a discussion. I think we have to be a lot more serious about disarmament. See, most Americans wish for peace, but they don't will it. And they want it in their shopping bags with a lot of other things that don't make for peace, like being number one in the world and so forth. As people left the church, mixed reviews for the film, but not for its message. I was bored. I thought it was a powerful movie, and I think it's going to make people more aware of the catastrophic effects. And uh, that's a lot of things to think about. Now, it should be stressed that most of the people at Riverside Church tonight said they had supported a nuclear freeze before seeing tonight's movie. The day after served to reinforce that support. Mark? Thank you, McGee. As millions of people watched the day after, we visited with one family in New Jersey tonight to get their reaction. Paul and Mary DiPascali watched with their 11-year-old daughter, but they sent their 5- and 8-year-old children to bed because they knew the film was very, very powerful and probably too much for them. It was completely devastating. It was a horrible thing to see the reality and how fast it could happen. Those of us who watch it in the viewing public are, are not the ones who really should get the education from that film. It's more the people who have the authority to push the button. It really happened. I would just want, I would just want to go die with the blast and not have to live and start, have to start all over again. I think I just feel a little stronger about the fact that we have to be strong. We still have to. We can't leave ourselves vulnerable. All the De Pascales agree that they'd remember the movie they saw together tonight for a long, long time. Yeah. Well, as we've so graphically seen, nuclear war is, of course, possible, but not necessarily inevitable. The U.S. and Soviet Union have been talking about limiting nuclear weapons for some 15 years now, with some success. However, as John Slattery tells us, the arms race does continue. What we have seen, the missiles launched, the nuclear explosions, the devastating results was all fiction. But what brought us to that point is fact. It's something we've been living with for years. It's the arms race, 
with both sides able to wipe out each other many times over. Both sides have missiles able to deliver more than one nuclear bomb or multiple warheads. The number of U.S. nuclear missiles, 1,975. The number of U.S. warheads, 9,200. The Soviet missiles, 2,750. The number of warheads, 8,800. The Soviets' intense buildup of nuclear arms began 21 years ago after the Cuban Missile Crisis. They built missiles, we built missiles. Our thinking was the only way to deter an attack was to have equal nuclear strength. The arsenals were growing so large that finally both sides saw the need to talk, SALT talks. SALT-1 was an attempt to limit strategic arms, but after an agreement was reached, the Soviets still had the lead. And they not only wanted to maintain the lead, but increase it, which they proceeded to do under SALT-1. Next, SALT-2, another attempt, but the Soviet buildup went on. We've made proposal after proposal after proposal, as the record shows, and they, they've just been rejecting, sidestepping it, making excuses, or outright uh, camouflaging their own buildup. With the Reagan administration, there was a new fervor for building defense and a continued concern about the Soviet threat. Today, in virtually every measure of military power, the Soviet Union enjoys a decided advantage. Much of the buildup has been medium-range missiles aimed at Western Europe. So the U.S. and NATO decided to install medium-range missiles of their own, 572 Cruise and Pershing II Two. missiles. The first of the missiles were delivered to England just last week. It sparked protests all over Europe, and the Soviets walked out of the Geneva talks. The issue is so volatile because of this. Long-range missiles fired between North America and the Soviet Union take 30 minutes to reach their targets. But medium-range missiles fired between the Soviet Union and Western Europe take only eight minutes to reach their targets. Not nearly enough time to check out whether blips on radar are missiles or just electronic mistakes. Someone could retaliate at a mistake. Currently in Europe, the U.S. is pushing for both sides to reduce the arsenals, but those who negotiate with the Soviets say what they want is clear. They would prefer superiority. Ambassador Louis Fields, who negotiates arms reductions with the Soviets, says he believes the Soviets do want to deal. I assume because they're involved in the negotiation that they want to reach an accommodation. They will drive the hardest bargain that they can. But they still want to maintain the edge. I, it is my view that they want to maintain the edge. Whether or not they can is another issue. They might be forced into equal arms. That, that is the position that we intend to drive them into. American negotiators are optimistic that arms on both sides can be reduced. And people concerned about the size of the arsenals say reduction is now or never. John Slattery, Channel 7, Eyewitness News.